Welcome back to Realism Overhaul. Today in episode two, uh, we have a little bit more to do with the Spiro 6 sounding rocket, and that is just creating an automation for it uh, using Kerbal Operating System. There's a few more contracts that can still get me a lot of money, a lot of funds, several thousand uh, at the least. I don't know, upwards of 20,000, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know for sure, uh, but contracts keep uh, popping up that Spira 6 is already capable of doing. So I just wanted to write a script um, to just automate it. So <laughs> this ended up taking two hours because of a lot of troubleshooting. Um, I'm not gonna show any of that today. <laughs> Uh, unless you guys express interest in it, um, I'm just gonna not show it. And I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly, so uh, it's not too boring. So the function setup is the first thing that happens. What it does is it, I, I created like little shortcut words for bigger things to make it easier to write later on. And also I printed out information on a screen, which I'm not sure is even visible in the episode. But uh, the next function is staging. And the staging will initially lift us off of the launch pad. And then when the fuel reserves are less than 70, it will stage again, which ignites our first, not our first, our second stage engine. And this ignites before main engine cutoff. Um, and that is to ensure that no vapor is goes into the fuel lines. When the fuel is less than 60, which at 66 fuel, the first stage is completely burned out and the second stage has taken over and there's no more fuel in the first stage. Um, at 60, not 66, it's, uh, it waits a little bit. Um, the first engine, this isn't really first engine cutoff, it's first engine separation. So our stage separates. And then when our fuel is less than five, um, it's just gonna print it out to uh, let us know that it did go through all the fuel and our second engine has cut off. Um, when phase is two, then stage. Uh, this, this jettisons the cone. And when phase is two, you'll see here, in the initial setup, phase is zero. I don't think check is even used. I should, I should cut that out, but I'll keep that in there for now. Uh, but phase is currently at zero. And uh, the way to put phase up to two is when uh, the difference between our altitude and our apoapsis is greater than 100, then we're, you set phase to phase plus one. So phase is set to one as soon as we start getting speed. As soon as we launch, basically, our phase is set to one. When the phase is set to one, um, and the this A's altitude is greater than, uh, it, basically when it gets close to the apoapsis, then um, phase is set to two. So even if the engines fail, um, phase is set to two as soon as we get close to our, our apoapsis, even if everything else fails. Um, and then when phase, uh, when it's phase two, and the apoapsis is less than 3,000 meters, the parachute is deployed. Function do launch just does these three, uh, these three functions, and that is it. This will completely automate um, the entire launch of Spira 6. However, it's not perfect. For instance, if an engine fails, I'm pretty sure all these stages will completely just screw everything over. But what I can do to remedy that, if I really feel like it, is set an action group to certain engines igniting and stage events so that it's not a stage event, it's a certain action. And that would be very easy. For instance, if I want the parachutes deployed to be action group eight, I would just put in boom, AG8, and then that's all I would need to do with the script. It's extremely easy to do. Um, I don't have extensive knowledge of KOS, but I know how to do little stuff like this. All right, and that leads us to our next order of business, and that is creating an X-plane. And this is the first aircraft of the space program, um, and this one is called Hester, or what it stands for is highly experimental, somewhat terrifying, aerodynamics aside, rocket jet. <laughs> Um, and I named it this because I assumed that this would crash and burn, 
but I was delightfully surprised um, on its performance, despite how uh, how strange it looked. The design I was sort of going for is to basically have three, I guess, tubes you'd call them. The central tube is the uh, the cockpit, as well as a fairing to just have like a aerodynamic spike tail, <laughs> something like that. And then um, these, I think they're called Dvent, Darwin engine, something like that. Someone think engines, I forget. Uh, it says it right there. Uh, what is going too fast? Something like that. Okay, well, yeah, those two engines, they don't have a ton of thrust. They don't have that much thrust at all. Um, and I needed to have two of them. So that's where I came up with the design of these, uh, this, the side fuel tanks there. And I tried to make them like aerodynamic, and I did clip a little bit. Um, I do clip things into other things when I build, but I, I don't like making it like extraordinarily unrealistic. I feel like um, having a fuel tank like this is within the boundaries, um, because that middle part, the middle part is the only part that holds any fuel. The um, aerodynamic th uh, cone on the front and aft of that fuel tank is just a structural piece. So I feel like this is completely within the bounds of clipping since it's merely structural. And here I'm using B9 wings to sort of make an, uh, this actually look like a plane instead of look like a torpedo of some sorts. Um, and I was going for swept wing designs on all of them, all the fins, the wings. And th this is me actually realizing that you could you could paint these to be just a solid color. So I did that with absolutely everything. Uh, I wasn't aware of that before. I guess I just didn't look close enough. But here we're getting the, um, the elevators on there. We got the tail fins. It's starting. It's starting to look like an aircraft now. Um, ever so slightly. Uh, anyways, I can talk a little bit about uh, the performance this thing has uh, before we actually see this thing fly. Uh, it can climb at 30 degrees until about 5,000 meters, and then it starts to lose velocity. It's capable of reaching Mach 1, albeit a little bit dangerously. Um, in simulations, we've had the engines melt, I guess, for un unknown reasons. Just at Mach 1, it likes to melt. I don't know. Um, the top speed I got to um, was, in, in, in testing, uh, about 350 meters per second with the engines melting. Um, the ceiling, I don't realize until the first flight, but it's about 10,000 meters. I can go higher for sure. Stall speed of 85 meters per second with the engines. Uh, it drops like a rock if you turn the engines completely off. Um, and touching down exceeding 100 meters per second is suicide. So, you know, pretty basic plain stuff. Um, I don't know a whole lot about FAR, so if anyone could tell me what these lines mean and how bad the aircraft design is, put it down in the comments below, I'd appreciate it. But without further ado, let's see this thing fly. Well, okay, let's see how some simulations go first. Forgot air, got air, fairy wants to get involved. Now featuring detachable wing. The ground ate my wheels, the air ate my plane. Oh hey look, the ground. How I've missed you. It seems I can't get away. Up and I'm done. Just a nice soft landing. Perfect. This is gonna be fine.
All right, fingers crossed. Jebediah at the controls and Hester 1 is airbound. Skybound? Either way, we do a half flip to celebrate right after takeoff. Jeb's very happy about that with his badass nature, but without all the fun and games out of the way, this flight has work to do. The first of which is a contract to fly at 6,000 meters for three minutes. And this seemed pretty easy enough. We just flew up to 6,000 meters. Suddenly the clouds appeared, but that's fine. We got to enjoy flying just above the clouds peacefully. There's also a few other contracts that this flight is intended to complete as well. Uh, one of them is to reach 5,000 meters altitude for the first time crewed, and that has already been successfully completed already with this flight. Uh, the next one is to reach 10,000 meters. Uh, which is what we intend to do after flying here for three minutes. Um, and then after that, we do have a few more control, uh, not controls, contracts for speed. The first of which being, I believe, 344 or 46 meters per second. And the second one being 350 meters per second. Looks like just a few more seconds until this one is complete. All right, yep, and the last thing that we need to do to complete that contract is to return home safely. Those three words are easier said than done, um, considering I actually had never landed this plane successfully. Um, the only actual land I've done, and I'm talking about in the simulations, by the way, since this is the first launch of the actual uh Reality, not the simulation. Um, I was able to ditch it in the water successfully, but every time I went to try to land uh, with its landing gear, something had happened to the engines already. Like they melted off, they blew off, so I was pretty much just a brick. Um, and here we are reaching the 340 some meters per second. There we go. And I'm doing these in a shallow dive because also in the simulations, I learned how fragile the wings are. Um, and I could bump them up, but I'd like, uh, bump. by that, I mean, I could bump up their strength in the editor, but I like to have the lightweight speed here, as dangerous it is. So the plan was to get high in the atmosphere and do shallow dives to reach that speed. And it was no problem whatsoever. Uh, the least amount of aerodynamic pressure on the wings possible. And here we are going back to the runway to try to do the most dangerous thing of this flight so far. And that would be to land. Now here I'm just going to fly past the runway. Um, just to sort of get a feel for what speed I should be going at to touch down. I'm going to fly right past. And this seemed okay, but I feel like um, if I was a little bit slower, it would work out a lot better. So I'm gonna go around again, and I'm gonna go a little bit slower. But in the meantime, I'm just going to <laughs> enjoy the scenery. Jebediah realizes, you know, this might, this might be it. This one flight might be it. So just gonna take a look around before we turn around and try to land on that runway again. This is the, the uh, first scariest thing. The second scariest thing, uh, like on the list of least scary, too scary, the second thing um, next to the most scary would be taking off. Because if you saw in the simulations, I also had a lot of trouble taking off. The only way to take off is really go, to, uh, go up to 80 meters per second on the runway and pull hard back and just hope for the best because if you hesitate or if you let yourself drop back onto the runway it's it's game over man game over and also if you noticed i took off from the launch pad and not the runway and had to taxi to the runway and that's because i don't have the runway um upgraded enough and this would have taken almost a year to build where it took 40 days on the vab but lucky enough I was able to touch down successfully and I tried to slow down on the runway but I ended up going over. But all in all, I think this was the most successful type of landing I could have ever wanted or desired from this flight. I want to thank you guys so much for watching and peace out. Would it be cool?